Hello, hello. Thank you all so much for tuning in to Ladies Living Beyond Limits. I am Mel, CEO and founder of Ladies Living Beyond Limits. And today we have with us Crystal Allen. But first, we are going to read her bio. Crystal Allen is a Newark, New Jersey native. She's a millennial entrepreneur and a non-profiteer who is no stranger to work that involves community development, social change, and grassroots efforts. She is presently employed with the New Jersey Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired under the Department of Human Services in the role of the Community Outreach Specialist. Prior to her current employment, she served as a second-term AmeriCorps VISTA member and a nonprofit organization known as the Girl Scouts Heart of New Jersey, located in Montclair, New Jersey. There, Crystal worked in, to develop volunteer programming, reuniting daughters in the Girl Scouts troops with their incarcerated mothers and building troops under their Juliet's House Transitional Housing Program. Crystal served her first AmeriCorps VISTA term during the winter of 2017 for the Jewish Renaissance Medical Center lo located in Newark and Perth Amboy, New Jersey. Here, she assumed the role of the marketing and planning and development coordinator with the medical center. Her responsibilities held a strong influence on her professional development in the areas of social media marketing, network building, sponsorship acquisition, and planning slash developing the organization's small and large scale programs and events. Crystal's service as an AmeriCorps VISTA member followed a year's commitment to be part of the fabric that recruits positive change in underserved communities. Simultaneously, Crystal serves as the founder and president of a growing nonprofit organization in the city of Newark called Eyes Like Mine Incorporated. Eyes Like Mine Incorporated has a mission to share awareness about the abilities and potential of, and potential of individuals with vision loss through community service initiatives, comprehensive empowerment workshops, and innovative social change awareness events. Crystal has served on the access committee of the New Jersey, of the Jersey City nonprofit organization, Art House Productions Incorporated for the past four years. She has been a board member of Young Nonprofit Professionals Network of New Jersey since the start of 2018 and a past board member with the Community Lifestyle Incorporated. Crystal's introduction to the nonprofit sector began when working with the Montclair YMCA for eight years in the extended care program. In addition to her involvement with the community, Crystal is a disability advocate for disability rights and against injustices. During the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic, she began serving with Governor Murphy's Disability Task Force to address areas that affected New Jersey's disabled residents. Additionally, Crystal served as a member of Mayor Baraka's Economic Reopening Advisory Council. For the first time in Mayor Baraka's administration, with the leadership of Eyes Like Mine Incorporated, the work of Crystal's budding nonprofit was instrumental in organizing a public event in observance of the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. During this event, the current mayor of Newark, the large multiplicity in New Jersey, proclaimed July 26, 2020 as Newark's ADA Day, adding to the 350 plus years of rich history of this great city. Crystal continues to advocate within the state's Personal Preference Assistance Program Advisory Council to contribute to policy management towards the functioning of New Jersey residents who receive personal care assistance. Although her work is just at its beginning stages, Crystal is, a bu is building a reputation of accolades from both local and government levels. Crystal is a graduate of Newark's University High School and continued her education by majoring in social science at Essex County College, Newark, New Jersey campus. Currently, she is actively pursuing her enrollment in the Leadership Newark two-year fellowship class of 2020 to strengthen her leadership abilities further. Lastly, Crystal has completed a community training program through the Greater Newark LISC. When she is not busy with her community development endeavors, she enjoys participating in, in, in a Toastmasters club member and online shopping. Despite her vision loss, Crystal has a vision gained to impact one community at a time through her combined advocacy activities. Thank you. Thank you so much for reading that. You're welcome. Crystal, welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having me. So for those who don't remember or don't know, Ladies Gonna Be Young Limits is focusing on women who are blind, visually impaired, living their best life, working in the community, 
advocating and just doing great things. So I'm super excited to have Crystal Allen here with us and just discuss her things and what she's doing within the community. And thank you so much again for coming. <laughs> it's been <Yes>. a while. <laughs> Yes. Okay, so um, first question I wanted to ask you, how did you get started? Because for me, you know, women who are, are visually impaired, we try to figure out, you know, different avenues on how we can put our foot into the ground within these communities. And as a person that's visually impaired, sometimes it seems so difficult. Um, what motivated you? Um, what motivated me to uh, get into the trenches of community work really started as a child, um, even before my vision loss. Um, my family on my father's side were very heavy into community development and Newark politics. And um, sometimes <laughs> when my dad would pick me up, we would be going to some city council member's office, uh, <laughs> stuffing envelopes, canvassing the community, uh, being a part of fundraising and community events. And when I started losing my vision, it was pretty much me trying to figure out my path and where I was going to be directed toward. And um, just some of those different experiences instilled in me inspired my uh, efforts towards community work and really my own lived experience because you know as women with disabilities women with vision loss we have to advocate for ourselves mm -hmm. a lot uh, harder than most people in different arenas whether it's something on a personal level a professional level educational and any other area that we touch down with so um, just some of those tools that my family instilled in me and my own lived experience as a person with a disability. And even I'm just, I've always been a helper. I'm the oldest of seven. So I'm used to everybody coming to me and I'm used to thinking about ways in which I can help. How was um, those, you said you're the oldest of seven? Yes, I'm the oldest of seven. Do you feel like that brought some of your leadership skills into the forefront now? Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> because uh, even at 11 years old, I was helping my mom out with my brothers and sisters a lot. And then when I started losing my vision, I wasn't certain if uh, my siblings would still look at me as the big sister, the oldest sister that they can come to. So it was important to me that um, I kind of figured out what I wanted to do or how I wanted to be received as a person first. You know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to be coddled. I didn't want to feel like um, I wouldn't be of value to my siblings and to my family. And I just wanted to be recognized for who I was. Yeah. And, you know, when you're the oldest, that's a leadership role right there. That's your first leadership role. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Do you mind talking a little bit how you lost your vision? Because you were not born visually impaired, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't mind sharing. I have a skin condition that I've had since I was five called eczema. And many people may be aware of it, but some people are not. And there's different strands of eczema. It could be rosacea, psoriasis, and then eczema. And there's different um, experiences with eczema. So my eczema was on a severe level and Eczema is pretty much asthma on the skin. Sometimes some people who have eczema, they also have asthma, depending on the severity of it. And I had both at the time. Mm -hmm. And my asthma wasn't as chronic as my eczema. And uh, my family on my mom's side, they are from Honduras, Central America. And they're used to a lot of uh, natural remedies to heal the body, heal the skin and any ailments. Mm -hmm. So sometimes my relatives would be traveling back and forth from Honduras to New Jersey and they would give me different treatments like 
golden seal tea, sana tea, uh, all types of stuff, the aloe plant. And sometimes I would receive some relief, but it wasn't really like permanent. Yeah. So um, my aunt who was living in New York, she recommended a dermatologist to my grandmother. And my grandmother and I, we went to this dermatologist. His name was Michael E. Jackson. <laughs> so um, when I went to begin treatment with him, it was a really great experience. For the first time at 16, I was comfortable wearing shorts, showing my skin, and just feeling comfortable in, in who I was yeah because my skin was so bad at one point that I could not walk for a week because my joints and my knees locked and I had to pretty much learn how to walk all over again and um after receiving treatment from him and such great success I was feeling so good but then I started having other problems a, a year after my treatment with him I was having headaches all day, every day. I was very fatigued. Sometimes when I walked, I would be unbalanced and it would appear as if I was going to pass out, but I just couldn't stabilize myself when walking. And the, the headache was the kicker. Like my head would hurt so bad. I could not lift my head. I could not turn my neck. Um, it would be really bad. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I had to white so um with all of that um I went to get treated by an ophthalmologist to figure out what was going on because another issue with all of these headaches that I wasn't aware of people on the outside looking in were noticing that my eyes were looking very large and it, it was looking like they were bulging out and um When I went to the first optometrist, he just told me my eyes were inflamed and that meant swollen. And he was giving me some drops. He said I had to come back in two weeks to get prescription eyewear and I should receive some kind of relief. I didn't know any change in my vision at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, And before the two weeks was over, I went back to the same uh, eye doctor and It it was a different eye doctor, actually. It was in the same clinic, but a different eye doctor. And he did more of a thorough examination with the visual field test and just trying to evaluate what the issue could be. And by the end of my visit with him, he determined that I had what is called pseudotumor cerebri. And basically what pseudotumor cerebri is, it's a brain tumor but it's a, a imitation of a brain tumor. Yeah. So pseudo meaning false. Okay. And then the cerebri represents the brain and tumor is pretty much the, the effect of the brain. And I don't actually ever grow a tumor in my brain, but I have all of the symptoms of a brain tumor. And in place of the tumor, I build excessive fluid around my brain, my optic nerves and my spine. And all of us have cerebral spinal fluid <clears throat> to protect the functioning of the brain. Yeah. But um, in most cases, your cerebral spinal fluid normal levels would be between 12 and 16, and mine would shoot up to 38. And if left untreated, um, it could result in a brain aneurysm and some fatality, but that wasn't my story, fortunately enough. Um, with all of those different, you know, items that I'm sharing. Um, after I was diagnosed with the pseudo tumor, I was rushed immediately to the hospital, and I pretty much spent the year in and out of the hospital, uh, trying to receive different treatments. And when I began uh, transitioning to a neuro ophthalmologist, which was a specialist for my particular condition, um, he was trying to figure out why. I developed this condition because at that time I was 16, I wasn't overweight at the time, and um, pseudotumor was very rare Mm -hmm. at that time for teenagers. Um, Most people who would be diagnosed with pseudotumor would be in their late 30s, early 40s, and they had high stress levels, they were uh, 
very obese, high salt intake. I didn't have any of those things going on. So he, he went to evaluate the history of my prescriptions and he learned that seven out of 25 medications I was prescribed from the dermatologist I was treated by contained an ingredient called tetracycline. And oh, since wow. it was seven of them all in the span of one year, my body reacted to it as an overdose. And that was what developed the pseudotumor. Oh. So um, that's really it in a nutshell. And I, I became uh, diagnosed legally blind because my vision cannot be corrected. And I've, I went through 22 spinal taps, two eye surgeries, and one temporary shunt uh, as a part of my treatment mm -hmm. to stabilize my current eyesight. So do you still have your shunt? Because you and I both have that alike. So I also um, have a pseudotumor. Um, and I had all of the, the surgeries and all that good stuff happening. Um, do you currently still have your shunt in now? No, it was a temporary shunt. Okay. Um, I was supposed to get a permanent shunt, but I, I just became very hesitant. I was afraid. Yeah. And I've heard of different stories of people with shunts and their success, but I just, I don't know. I just didn't feel comfortable yeah. with a foreign object on my brain. <laughs> Stand here you know I had to for me it was it was the headaches like you were explaining it was the headaches they were just like pounding I just oh my goodness it felt like someone was hitting my head with a hammer and I was like this has got to stop and so I was oh my I was 20 when this happened so I was a little bit older yes I was overweight and stressed out <laughs> But for me, I, I think this is really good because a lot of people don't know um, how, you know, you go through one day, you you can see pretty good. And then there is a moment where, you know, there are some medical issues that may come over, you know, arise and say, okay, my life is changing. There is something about my life that's changed. So do you feel like you went through any kind of stages of um, depression or not understanding what's going on? Uh, well, the depression didn't happen right away. That's mm -hmm. so weird. It didn't happen right away, my depression, but I was uncertain because mm -hmm. I didn't know what legally blind really meant Yeah, because I could still see some things. And then I didn't know what to expect because I was told I would go totally blind by the time I was 30. And then I asked the uh, resident doctor when I was in the emergency room, I was like, am I going to die? And, and then they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, what? what? <laughs> that wasn't the best response. Doctor. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, at, at a young age, when you're going through a major life transition, um, you're, it's a lot of uncertainty that follows mm -hmm. and even my family and my family seemed like they took it a little harder than me at first yeah. and for a while I was I guess I didn't realize that maybe I could have been coming into depression because my family members was like how come she doesn't talk about it and I didn't know what to say I didn't yeah. know what should I be saying because I was just going through it yeah so I didn't yeah. know what to say it's the, those moments where you're just going through the motions because it's uh, like you said it's uncertain it's unclear I don't know what to expect so I don't want to add to it by you know worrying about it and I mm -hmm. totally get them so just transitioning I, I do want to kind of put this you know because a lot of times people don't realize you know when something like this traumatic happened to you your family is also involved and like you said they were, you know, questioning, like, why is she not talking about it? Or they may was feeling it more than you was because they were worried about you. They were trying to figure out how can we help her? Mm -hmm. Do you think your relationship, you know, became more closer to your family or a little distant with them because of, you know, losing your vision or going through that stage? Um, well, we've always been close on both sides. My family has always been a really great support to me throughout my whole life. It, I feel it increased after losing my vision because everybody 
wasn't familiar with the blind community, the disability yeah. community, they probably just uh, knew some basic stuff like Stevie Wonder and Ray Charles. Yeah. And that was oh. all <laughs> the extent of it. They didn't know that there's some amazing people in the blindness community just yeah. doing it and making a way for others and just living a quality life. I mean, I know they uh, once they wanted me to pursue a life of good quality but they weren't really certain how that was gonna shape out so they just tried to be there for me in the best ways that they could and sometimes it was a bit much I had to kind of like scale them back like come on people just relax (laughs) I feel love but relax (laughs) you know so um and then once they saw me coming into my own and trying to figure out my way then they they sat back and allowed me to just be me but there was a lot of hesitance at first like even with simple things like uh my grandmother she would be like my friend Juliet saw you crossing the street and you had on an all-black coat at night and I'm like okay (laughs) I was like, well, I couldn't uh, change the night coming and my coat was black because that's the one I wanted to wear. So basically she was trying to say, you shouldn't be walking outside at night with all black on. Somebody could hit you. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> So, you know, what I started to do once I became a little more active in uh, figuring out what the blindness community was, Mm. when they had conventions and different meetings, I would invite my grandparents, I would Mm -hmm. invite my mother, my father, my other grandmother, I would invite them so that they could see, like, you know, there's a lot of people who are dealing with vision loss and it's not impossible to live your life in spite of of your vision loss, you know? It's, it may take some people um, a little more time to adjust than others, but for those who just dive in full throttle, you know, they make the best out of it. That's all you can do. That's good. You know, I've never thought about like inviting family members to different events. It was always like, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to go and they're going to see me do it, but not really just see other people. And I think that is uh, uh, really important for people to just share, not even just within your own family. And that's the reason why we have Ladies Women Beyond Limits is to give an um, insight on visually impairments, you know, blindness, the community as a whole, because a lot of times people think you cannot do certain things because of your limited vision or may you may not have any vision at all. So that's really good. I like that. I like that. So when you transition into like learning things about you and what you can and cannot do, was there ever a time where you felt like, okay, I'm over this? Um, well, what do you mean by that? I'm over this. Well, just like, um, I'm not ready to go in and pretty much work within the community. Uh, I'm just gonna, cause there are times where we sit back and we're like, okay, I can't do that because for me, I don't know about, I'm not really familiar with, um, Jersey and things like that, but I know you guys do a lot of transportation on um, public transportation, but here in, in Texas, you know, a lot of times we, everything is kind of far and spread it out. And so we have to drive everywhere and with just driving, you know, those things I know I could not do anymore. So was there ever a moment in your life where you're like, okay, I want to do this, but I'm so tired. I feel like I'm struggling or, you know, is there a time in your life where you felt, okay, this is something I want to do, but I just know I cannot do it. And and you just kind of gave up. Not not necessarily gave up, but gave into the fact that you are now visually impaired. Oh, well, I didn't, I didn't feel like I was giving into being visually impaired. I felt like I began to become more curious about what I was going to be able to do because, you know, I would be sitting home for so long Mm -hmm. listening to Tweet, (laughs) whole (laughs) album, and Dave Hollister, and Music Soul Child. Just Those are my three main albums I'd be listening to while I'm sitting at home, or sometimes I'll be watching TV. And then I'm like, you know, 
I wonder if I can do some more things. Like, yeah. what am I able to do? Yeah. So, um, and I used to like to write spoken word. And I was like, dang, I'm not going to be able to do that no more. But then one day I just had um, picked up a dark marker and I started writing mm-hmm. on some yellow lined paper. And when I realized that I could still see those things, I said, oh, okay. And my brother, Nicholas, at the time, he was five and he was learning his colors. And I just said, I was like, yo, maybe let me see if we can go to the store. And at that time, like, um, sometimes my family would always leave me with one person, whether it's a sibling or a relative or whatever, because I needed to be observed with the certain medication I was on. So me and my brother, Nick, we would spend a lot of time together and uh I was I said to him I was like Nick let's let's try to go to the store today (laughs) and so I just wanted to go to the corner store just to get candy (laughs) and so uh we started going out and then it went from going to the corner store to going downtown Newark and shopping and going to get my hair braided and all types of stuff and so um how we started off was I was like Nick do you know how to recognize red, yellow, and green? And he's like, yes. And I was like, okay, great. I was like, so red means we stop, right? I'm like, and yellow means we slow down and green, we can go. And so he's like, okay. So we would get from one corner of the street and I'm like, all right, Nick, is there any traffic lights here? Do you see any lights anywhere? He's like, no. He's like, I see a red sign. I'm like, oh, so that must be the stop sign. Uh, um. then, you know, that's how <laughs> we would get through the city. And it would be so funny because I didn't realize it. I'm over here trying to figure out my little independent path yeah. using my brother's eyes. Yeah. But I was really teaching him how to cross the street at five years old. Oh, cool. That's <laughs> So it kind of worked out for both of us. <laughs> and so from that, it went on to other curiosities, like catching the bus. Mm-hmm. And uh, one day I wanted to take my brothers and sisters to a discovery zone. And so I had started using this paratransit service. And I'm like, yes, we go into discovery zone, guys. <laughs> You know, because I still wanted to be the big sister, fun and everything, you know. And so one day my mother, she was so upset because they didn't know I was going out like this with my siblings. (laughs) And she called me and she was like, Crystal, where are you at? If you want to get my kids killed, you want to get yourself killed, you do that on your own time, bring my kids here. And I'm like, your kids, they're my my brother and sister. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we got back home safely. And then one day my mom, she really needed me to get my siblings from school. Mm-hmm. So she called me. She was like, Crystal, do you think you could go pick um, such and such up? And I'm like, all right you sure about that (laughs) she's like yes can you just go pick them up and I'm like okay so I went and got them and we came back and I was just you know we were fine and I'm like oh so now you calling me to pick them up I thought we were gonna be getting killed and in a car accident and all of these things and she's like oh please (laughs) so (laughs) you know I guess me just taking a chance on myself uh, gave my family the opportunity to see that Mm -hmm. I was trying to spread my wings and figure out what I'm able to do from what I'm not and if there are things that I'm unable to do you know how to be more vocal and let people know but I'm I'm a little I guess stubborn so I will always try to do something first before I ask someone because I just need to know that I can be reliable to myself Mm -hmm. and um, be independent so being independent is very important to me so do you use a cane um oh yeah okay when did you use your cane when did you start um well I will have to tell you I was very ignorant to the cane when I was first introduced to it um I did not understand the role of a mobility instructor I just thought it was so silly at first yeah 
I was like, what are they doing? <laughs> I was just so ignorant. And so, but I was very young too. Mm-hmm. And then I realized, you know, that was going to be my tool for independence. Yeah. Real independence, because I couldn't always rely on my little brother coming with me someplace or mm-hmm. someone walking with me someplace everybody has their own little life to live yeah so I cannot guarantee that every time I wanted to make a move I could call up whoever and say hey can we go to the store can you take me to the doctor or whatever and by then you know I was in my early adulthood so I said I'm gonna have to use this cane and my mobility instruction I started receiving at I think 17 and although I wasn't too certain about it at first I didn't use it as frequently because I just still didn't grasp the concept and it was still so much I could still see so I I was like I don't really need this and then there would be times when I would want to go out with friends and they'll be telling me that I don't need my cane and I'm like okay and then they they would say I didn't need my cane but then they didn't always want to you know assist me right and so that's when I started learning who was my real friends Mm -hmm. because you know some friends didn't want to be around me because of using my cane Mm -hmm. they felt like I looked like the disabled person Mm -hmm. and um I just was like you know what I can't be too worried about what other people are thinking Exactly. about you know what I'm trying to do in my life whether it's the use of my cane or working or whatever it is that I want to try to do all I can do is try and make it happen for myself and whoever has a problem with it it's not my job to make them comfortable because I'm visually impaired mm. like, I can't control that you know it's a part of my life yes so um using my cane became a thing it became a thing to the point where I started decorating my cane putting (laughs) bling on it or getting custom canes that were already made in different (laughs) colors you know I had to give my cane personality (laughs) that's good same here (laughs) so I know you are doing so many great things now and I want to transition and talk about them Let's talk about your nonprofit and just your whole ideal behind it, because you're doing some really great things and kudos to you. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, um, I like my ink was started in 2014 of March and it started with the conversation with the friend and it really started because uh, I was going through a transition with a guy and I was feeling all depressed and sad about myself and just wasting my thoughts on someone who wasn't thinking of me and then I just picked up the phone like it, it was like I had an epiphany and so I picked up the phone and I called my good friend and I said hey do you want to start a nonprofit organization and um she was said she said, okay, I'm with it. <laughs> like that's her response to things. And so we didn't have a clear idea on what we were going to do with the nonprofit at first. We were just in conversation. And then I um, knew my cousin was graduating law school and I figured I would need some type of legal representation. Mm-hmm. And I called him up and he was open to the idea. And then um, I let my father know because my father, he's very heavy into community work and I figured he would have some knowledge to advise and participate and then like you know a lot of the things that I started doing my father became very interested in like um I traveled to Tokyo Japan at 21 and I was like telling him like I think I want to try to do this and he helped me uh complete the application and then before you knew it I was traveling to Tokyo Mm -hmm. and then when I came back because of that experience Mm -hmm. and seeing different people with disabilities um and how the culture is in Japan for uh technology with technology being such a huge tool for independence for people with disabilities when I came back I was thinking about um ways in which I could pay it forward to 
the community I'm now in, the blindness community and the disability community. And then it just so happened that I was going through my little personal situation. Mm -hmm. And through that personal situation, I just began to really have some really innovative ideas. And the the bond and the strength of friendship with me and my friend, Aquila Wright Prevo, we both were the first people to meet each other who had pseudotuma cerebri. So we never really met anyone else who had it. And me being legally blind, she became totally blind almost instantly from it. And uh, our conversations with our adjustment to vision loss and us just building a strong um, relationship turned into us starting our organization and most of our lived experiences we poured into our organization yeah. so um, she's a performer and a songstress and a writer so we started a performing arts uh, event called Dancing with the Blind and that became our version of Dancing with the Stars oh, nice. and you know, it's a fun way to interact with people who are not in our community yeah. because it's usually one-sided person and either one other visually impaired person or a group of visually impaired people who come together and they form a dance of their own with any genre of music. And then we have a recital at the end and we put on this event to bring awareness to vision loss and awareness to the abilities of someone who's blind and visually impaired. So, you know, like in Dancing with the Stars, the, um, there's usually a celebrity and a trained dancer. So the celebrity in this instance is the blind or visually impaired person and the trained dancer would be someone who's sighted. Mm -hmm. And um, some people who have done Dancing with the Blind they may not have necessarily been a dancer yeah. at first, and they may have been self-conscious about, you know, <laughs> rhythm and music, but once they started, you know, it became something fun and something that was really unique that wasn't really being done too much before. And then we went into um, collaborating with a person named Monique Coleman. She has a company called Vistas Education, and she's a TVI. Um, teacher of the visually impaired and so we started doing salsa in the dark also and we incorporated that into dancing with the blind so um, a lot of the things that have been done with eyes like my knee have just really been through uh, inspiration conversation and um, just trying to really bring that awareness because even though visually impaired and blind people have been living since the beginning of beginning of time there's still so much that people just aren't aware of right you know and there's so many possibilities available to us and the people who are a part of our lives that people need to become more knowledgeable about and um Eyes Like Mine Inc. is a 501c3 tax exempt organization. It's a nonprofit registered in New Jersey. And uh, we've done a lot in the time that we've been servicing our community. And there's so much more to be done. Um, but this pandemic has really allowed us to expand further. Yeah, yeah. Technology, thank God for it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, because if not, I would not have had the opportunity to meet you, yeah. you know, <laughs> getting a chance to meet people from so many different states and even countries mm -hmm. just through the power of Zoom yes. um, and supporting each other in this journey because this pandemic is so challenging for everyone, mm -hmm. but especially people in the disability community because social isolation has increased to its greatest height. Yeah. So it's like we're in a box on a, a computer or a smart device trying to stay connected with each other. And, but in the midst of those attempts, we've been creating a lot. We've been innovating yeah. and trying to make life a little easier for each other. 
Um, and so my organization, we've been doing a lot during this pandemic where we have support groups weekly and we've introduced over well over 150 speakers to our participants of our support group. And it's a way to connect individuals with resources to uh, talk about their feelings about adjusting to vision loss and to empower them to see beyond their blindness. Because even though we have vision loss, our inner vision still exists. Our inner visions can still mm -hmm. thrive, you know? Mm -hmm. We can still dream and we can achieve our dreams. You know, it's nothing too, uh, I'll say ambitious mm -hmm. to try to achieve. It, it used to be a time when so many people would tell me, Crystal, you're so ambitious, you're so ambitious. Mm -hmm. And they would say it because they're like, gosh, this girl just wants to do this and she wants to do that. And it's like, you know what? I can honestly say, in spite of what anybody has ever said to me about what I do with my organization, um, everything that I've spoken, I've done. Yeah. So you gotta speak it out to existence. Mm -hmm. And I will always take this uh, lyric from Mariah Carey's song, make it happen. If you believe in yourself enough and know what you want, you're gonna make it happen. And that is such a true statement. That's very you powerful. know, yeah, right. You know, like if you know you want to do X, Y, and Z, no matter how small it is or how much work it is involved with it, if you say you want to do it mm -hmm. and you follow that up with action, it's going to definitely happen. And sometimes you might even surprise yourself when you think that, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. Just as soon as you get started, you'll be like, oh, okay, it was possible, you know. Mm -hmm. because like I said we didn't have a clear vision on what we were going to be projecting out into communities we just knew that we were living our life and we knew that it could be other groups of younger people in our age group that may be experiencing what could be seen as a challenge yeah but it's really just us living life yeah um and we wanted to connect with people so we did that through dancing with the blind our peer support group uh, our book club, and then we stepped into Miss Blind Diva. I was going to ask about that too. <laughs> Talk about it. Because I love the concept. And mm -hmm. I was just, when I Googled and I was like, oh, that is a, a pageant for blind people? What? I like <laughs> this. So please tell us about it. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the Miss Blind Diva pageant it is not your traditional pageant you know most pageants are beauty pageants and they may have other components involved to it um but the pageant was birthed through um a nickname I gave myself when I was in college which is blind diva and the reason I did that it might sound very egotistical but it really wasn't I just knew I used to walk around my campus with high heels and, Girl, my yes. <laughs> and I don't know like you know I like to dress up you know mm -hmm. part of dressing up makes you feel so good even yes. when you could be feeling low mm -hmm. you know just trying to uh build yourself up with what you wear, putting some personality mm -hmm. into your uh, presentation. It just, you know, it, it makes you transform a little bit. Exactly, yeah. And so um, I would always be noticed so much in particularly because of my cane. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I couldn't understand why people would stop their whole conversation look. when <laughs> I would walk through with my cane. <laughs> like they would stop walking, they would stop talking. I'm like, what is happening here? And so, um, so then I would hear a follow-up. Oh, they go to blind girl. Oh, watch out, she blind. Oh, 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 wait, she's coming. She's the blind girl is coming. And I, I couldn't stand that. Uh. I used to be like, what is wrong with these people? So I was like, you know what? Every time somebody says something like that to me, I'm gonna make them call me blind diva. Uh -huh. And I'm gonna give them <laughs> something to lick at too. <laughs> right. So then it became a thing and people be like, hey, blind diva, hey, blind diva. And even to this day, oh, is that the blind diva? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so uh, when I began the organization and we were thinking about other innovative ways to connect with communities, mm -hmm. 
uh, we said, why not have a pageant? And really, why not have a title holder? Mm -hmm. So we started off with a title holder in our first year anniversary. And we had our first year anniversary at Jay-Z's mom's restaurant, which was called Diamonds in the Rough, and it was mm -hmm. in Newark. And um, when we did that there, it was just really great. We, we did like a little recruitment announcement for someone who was really uh, a pillar in their community who happened to be blind and visually impaired and uh, nominations. So we were accepting nominations and we got a few nominations. Um, and with that, we recognize Patricia Ebel, who's from Secaucus, New Jersey, as our very first title holder for the Miss Blind Diva uh, title. And because it was just a nomination at first, the following year, we decided, why not have a full pageant? Mm -hmm. And so the pageant is an empowerment platform. It's not a beauty pageant. Mm -hmm. uh, we have different uh, sessions that lead up to the finale day. And they're all to prepare and to also have some type of resources to um, stay connected with post the pageant. Yeah. So it's called the Miss Blind Diva Empowerment Pageant. And it's about... Mm, anywhere between 12 to 16 weeks of participation and uh, we've had a total of five pageants so far we just had our milestone year in 2021 we've had three in-person pageants and two virtual pageants because once the pandemic hit we were like we're not gonna allow that to stop us that's yes. even more of a reason for us to be empowered and want to connect with more women because yes, yes. you know what else can we do we need to connect we need to stay <laughs> exactly <connected. laughs> networking <laughs> you know and so there is a process um we usually begin recruitment in March because it's Women's History Month, and this mm -hmm. is a part of our women's history, and we usually end our recruitment in June, um, and we transition from having our pageant in June to having it in October because October is Blindness Awareness yeah. Month, and um, once we begin our recruitment, there is an application fee, and um along with the application fee and filling out the application, the women who uh, submit, they have to create a two to three minute video uh, showing them doing something independent. And it could be any type of creative video to their liking, as long as they don't exceed uh, the time frame. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to connect with women all over. We've had, um, I think eight title holders because there's two titles that the women who participate can get mm -hmm. there's the miss independent youtube challenge title and then there's the ultimate title which is miss blind diva okay. who will be the ambassador for the year and um we've given out different cash prizes we've given over three thousand dollars in cash prizes to different women who've participated over the years. Um, we've given away technology. We've given an opportunity for the women to highlight their professionalism and their um, educational backgrounds. And uh, we've connected with women from as near as New Jersey to as far as Jamaica. And since this pandemic has happened, we've had our first international title holder, which is Ms. Tanaka Williams from mm -hmm. Kingston, Jamaica. And um, our second Texan title holder, Miss Naomi Panarella from Houston, Texas. Nice. So, um, you know, we look forward to connecting with more women and empowering. Yeah. We've even had our men in uniform escort our ladies in Ooh. 2018. <laughs> so <laughs> we had police officers and firefighters dressed in uniform and they weren't to be like a piece to uh, guide them. Mm -hmm. They were they were the arm candy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we had our pageant in person, they were their escorts in 2018 and 2019. And we've had one title holder who was deaf blind, our first title holder. Um, so women have connected from mm -hmm. New Jersey, New York, California, Maryland, Florida, 
Texas, Russia, Jamaica. Hi. And um, we just look forward to expanding more. Um, our title holders, some of the uh, package prize they receive. Um, now we incorporated uh, giving up a cash prize to our Miss Independent title holder. And every year we evolve. Not one year is the same. Mm -hmm. Every year it's a different experience in spite of our planning. And we, we want our women to kind of uh, tailor the pageant to suit their experience. Yeah. So, so we do provide a platform, but we let them know like, this is your experience. So if you see that there's something that we can do to add to it, so it can be memorable to you, mm -hmm. then by all means, you know, let us know and we're open and welcoming to um, any ideas. And uh, we have a planning team for our pageants. So our title holders get to be a part of the planning team. Uh, they assume their title for one year and they do a lot of work to help us reach success from year to year to year. And um, uh, our ultimate title holder wins $1,000, a crystal plaque, uh, flowers, um, jewelry, her crown, her sash, and just assuming the responsibility of making sure that more women and more communities can connect with our empowerment platform. That is really good. That is so exciting because we need more of that. And thank you again for coming onto this platform and just sharing how you are a woman that is visually impaired living life beyond limits. And before we leave, I do want you to share with us, how can we get in contact with you? Oh, well, you can always contact me through our different social media platforms and our website. Our handle is at Eyes Like Mine Inc. on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and we now have a little TikTok. We even have a room on Clubhouse called Eyes Like Mine Inc. And our website is eyeslikemine.org. And if you want to directly connect with me, you can email info, I-N-F-O at eyeslikemine.org. And that's E-Y-E-S-L-I-K-E-M-I-N-E dot O-R-G. And uh, email any any inquiries if you want to become a part of us in any kind of way. Um, during this pandemic, we've also been able to create internship opportunities for sighted and visually impaired students pursuing their educational careers. Mm -hmm. So you know that's a, a an addition to stay connected. So if you uh, like volunteerism and you want to make a difference. Uh, definitely email and reach out. We also have a telephone number you can dial, which is 973-327-3035. And um, if this session here that you heard inspired you in any way, please contact Eyes Like Mind Inc. Yes. Uh, one other thing I want to leave with, if there is something you could share to another woman who's visually impaired, uh, motivating them, empowering them to do what it is that they're wanting to do within their lives, um, what would that be? Like, how would you tell them, hey, go after your dreams, follow your dreams and in your words? Well, I can say, and this is a part of my email signature, I, I felt like this was so powerful. Um, don't allow your doubts to be bigger than your dreams. Mm -hmm. And that pretty much is self-explanatory. You know, you might, you might question your own self about your abilities at some times or question, you know, oh, this is a crazy idea. Why do I want to do this? But, you know, it's okay to do that. That's a normal way of thinking. But don't allow any doubts that you think would prevent you from pursuing the next phase of your life, the next success that's meant for you, because we're all meant for success. So don't allow your doubts to be bigger than your dreams. Yes, I love it. I'm so glad we had an opportunity to meet and listen, because of this pandemic, it's not going to keep me from getting a chance to give you a really big hug. Right now, it has to be virtual. <laughs> Yes. I I Thank you, Melva. Thank you. <laughs> I love everything that you're doing and I love networking with you. It's just such a pleasure to know that there are other women out there 
who are visually impaired, um, disabled, living life beyond limits. And so guys, again, please check her out. Please check all of the things that she's doing within the community and get in contact with her. And she may need some sponsors, so please check her out. All righty. <laughs> Ladies, we're living beyond limits. So stay tuned because next week we're going to have some really, really um, good things coming up. And there will be other women just like Crystal who are sharing their um, ventures out within the community as women who are visually impaired. So thank you all for tuning in. Bye. I know you were encouraged. I know you learned something. And I'm super, super certain that you were inspired. So continue this. Listen, like, subscribe. And I know you want to share this with someone else. So you, go ahead, share this video. Listen, we here for positive vibes. Continue. Do you. And do it great. Because greatness is you. Thanks for tuning in to Ladies Living Beyond Limits YouTube channel. Bye now. Ladies, I'm living, you living, we living. Yeah, beyond.